Not long ago, I saw that the Irish rock band U2 will be playing at the Capital One Arena this summer on June 17th and 18th. And it crossed my mind that those fellows have been around for quite a while. My freshman year of college, 36 years ago, was the group's breakout year. After only modest success on their two previous albums, they recorded the album War from September to November of 1982, released its first single, New Year's Day, on January the 1st of 1983, and from there for months you couldn't turn on the radio or music television without the band's music streaming out. Well, it probably wasn't on NPR, but I didn't listen to NPR at the time. And you're probably wondering why I'm talking about this. Well, seeing that the band was playing here this summer started up an earworm for me. The chorus of the song, Sunday, Sunday Bloody Sunday, just over and over on endless repeat, much like it was in 1983. And in an effort to make the jukebox in my head turn off, I googled Bloody Sunday to get the background on what the song was about. The Bloody Sunday that the song describes was an incident in 1972 when British soldiers shot 28 unarmed Irish civilians during a peaceful march protesting against internment, a practice by which suspected members of the Irish Republican Army could be rounded up and imprisoned without trial. Fourteen people died on Bloody Sunday, some of them shot in the back while fleeing. Others were bludgeoned with batons and two were intentionally run down by army vehicles. It was a terrible event, underscoring what can happen when activism meets armed authority. But in the way that Google can take you right down a rabbit hole, I also encountered two other articles describing an event called Bloody Sunday. On January 22, 1905, in St. Petersburg, Russia, a group of unarmed protesters led by a Russian Orthodox priest was marching to the Winter Palace of Tsar Nicholas II to present a petition calling for social reforms when they were fired upon by soldiers of the Imperial Guard. Does this sound familiar? On this bloody Sunday, an estimated 150 to 200 people were killed, hundreds more injured, and nearly 700 arrested. And of course, our country's history is not without its own bloody Sunday. That March 7th day in 1965, when 600 peaceful civil rights protesters advocating equal voting rights for African Americans and the repeal of the South's Jim Crow laws set out to march from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama along U.S. Route 80. They made it six blocks. Crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge leading out of Selma, they were met by state and local lawmen who ordered them to disperse. When they refused and instead stopped to pray, the authorities attacked them with billy clubs and tear gas and drove them back into Selma. U.S. Representative John Lewis, a civil rights protest leader at the time, had his skull fractured in the fray. The same John Lewis, by the way, ceremonially led yesterday's March for Our Lives in Atlanta. So, Bloody Sunday. The name describes three separate events that all began as peaceful Sunday demonstrations. Three separate instances of the authorities who were there to keep the peace, instead initiating the violence. It raises the question, were they trying to keep the peace or keep the power? Power always, always, always wants protest to sit down, to keep silent, to wait its turn, to behave, to stop disturbing the peace of the status quo. 
And maybe that's why the first thing that leaps out at me from our text from Luke's Gospel is the group of Pharisees who come to Jesus in the midst of the Palm Sunday parade with the message, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. If we listen carefully, even amid the cries of the palm-waving crowd, we can hear the implied rest of their message. Or else. We're so conditioned, I think, to reading the story from our post-resurrection perspective, so used to seeing Palm Sunday as simply a part of the pre-Easter festivity, that we don't see the Palm Parade for what it is a powerful protest march aimed at challenging the powers that be, both religious and political, in favor of a different king, a different kingdom, a greater authority. It's a peaceful protest, but it's a pointed protest against a rule-bound religious structure that is more concerned with condemning outcasts and sinners than embracing them and against a political structure that rewards the wealthy and the powerful at the expense of the poor and the powerless. It's a kind of protest that can't go unnoticed and won't go unpunished. Do you think it's a coincidence that Jesus rides into town at the height of the Passover celebration? Jerusalem's normal population of about 50,000 swelled to about 150,000 with the addition of Passover pilgrims. Jesus is not seeking to sleep, slip into town unnoticed on the second Thursday of July. He is staking a kingdom claim when the population of Jerusalem is at its high ebb, when the temple is in its highest high gear, and when the Roman authorities are on high alert. Triumphal entry is not a spontaneous outpouring, not an impromptu pep rally that erupts when Jesus comes to town. This is the first recorded flash mob. <laughs> it looks spontaneous, but it's thoroughly choreographed. He sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village where you will find a colt that has never been ridden untie it and bring it here. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. They are with great intent enacting the passage from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That much is familiar to us. But Zechariah's words continue. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion, his empire, shall be from sea to sea. There's only room for one empire, you know. Only room for one kingdom. So now do you see why the Pharisees are so quick to rush up? Shh! Teacher, order your disciples to stop before they ruin everything. But here we encounter the crucial difference between peacekeeping and peacemaking. Peacekeeping sets out with the goal of an unruffled status quo. Peacekeeping is Lyndon Johnson saying to Martin Luther King Jr., be patient. The Civil Rights Act is passed, but the Voting Rights Act We'll have to wait another five or ten years. The country isn't ready. We have to strive to keep the peace even at the price of injustice. Peacemaking, by contrast, 
recognizes that genuine and lasting peace and injustice can't live together on the same block. Where peacekeepers whisper, keep silent if you know what's good for you, peacemakers are singing, we shall overcome even if it disturbs the peace. Jesus, in fact, has no interest in keeping a counterfeit peace. He has no interest in settling for Herod because someone else might be worse. If you settle for less than the kingdom of heaven, you live in somebody else's kingdom. Rather than support the hard-won, uneasy alliance of the Romans and the religious authorities, Jesus rides into town in the middle of Passover and hits them right in the temple. He entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling things there, saying, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of robbers. And out go the money changers, who for a fee provide the service of exchanging Roman coins for Jewish coins to support the temple offerings. And out go the sellers of doves and animals who have made a fine living out of offering sacrificial animals at less than sacrificial prices. Need a dove or a lamb? Just stop by Sacrifices R Us on your way into worship. We're your one-stop temple shop. Jesus takes on a corrupt system that works for the Romans, works for the Jewish leaders, works for everyone, except for the poor and the sinful and the oppressed, and in so doing, he jams a stick right in the spokes of the wheel of commerce. When I was a child, I couldn't understand why they killed Jesus. As an adult, I can't see why they waited till Friday. Why it wasn't Bloody Sunday instead of Palm Sunday. In fact, it just took until Friday to work out the details. Our scripture concludes... Every day he was teaching in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the leaders of the people, the peacekeepers, were looking for a way to kill him. But they did not find anything that they could do for all the people were spellbound by what they heard. So now that we're hearing the story aright, what's the Palm Sunday message for 2018. I'm afraid it remains a bit of an incendiary message, a call to the church to be a bit less reverent and a bit more relevant. It's not merely a message of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, not merely a message of personal salvation nor a personal savior. It remains a call to a different kingdom ruled by a different king, a prince of peace who is absolutely willing to disturb the peace in pursuit of heaven's peace and to oppose and depose earth's kingdoms in pursuit of the kingdom of heaven. He comes to oppose the aims and the instruments and the incidents and the implements of violence. He comes for the poor, for the downtrodden, for the downcast, for the outcast, for the oppressed, for the repressed, for the oppressed, the depressed, the victims of the system that say, shh, he comes to announce that the kingdom of heaven won't wait. He looks upon the underfed, the undereducated, the underrepresented, the underclass, the underdogs, he surrounds them with his care and he commends them to our care. He comes for you and comes for me and he comes to bring the kingdom to us and for us and with us and around us and if necessary, despite us. If on this Palm Sunday we would hail his kingship, then we must at all costs serve his kingdom and no other. If the kingdom is not yet here, then it's not yet okay. If any are excluded, then that may be good enough for government work, but it's not worthy of God's work. And we must, when necessary, be willing to disturb the peace until the peace is in pieces and the voiceless are given voice at last 
to sing Hosanna. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace and glory in highest heaven. Thanks be to God. 